1990s were Michael Jordan's decade in the NBA. While he was winning six titles with the Bulls, 29 other organizations missed out on championship glory. These are the stories of some of the teams that were relegated to footnotes on MJ's path to the top. Today, the Utah Jazz, the most ironically named entity in the history of entities. The name made sense when the franchise was based in New Orleans, but they just let it ride when they moved to Salt Lake City in 1979. And quietly, in the last 37 seasons, Utah's finished over 500 every year but two. Always good, not necessarily great. They had chances to win it all. In the 1984 NBA draft, three of the first five picks became Hall of Famers. And so did the 16th pick, a point guard named John Stockton from Gonzaga, 15 years before Gonzaga became Gonzaga. The following year, the Jazz took Carl Malone out of Louisiana Tech with the 13th pick. You can't talk about one of these guys without discussing the other. They played together in Utah for 18 seasons. They made a combined 24 all-star teams and both made the dream team. They are the defining pick and roll combination in NBA history. Stockton is the NBA's all-time leader in assists and steals. Malone is second all-time in points, eighth in rebounds, and won two MVPs. And toughness, in 1997, Stockton missed 18 games. Outside of that, Stockton and Malone missed 14 games total, three of those for Malone's suspensions. And let's not forget about the most unlikely thing about this cornerstone duo. Somehow, Utah selected two all-time great NBA players who were perfect fits for Salt Lake City. Malone was the mailman, the most rural superstar in NBA history, even more country than the dudes from West Virginia. He drove an 18-wheeler in his spare time. Stockton? We never even bothered to give Stockton a real nickname. He's not the white something or other, or some play on Benny Goodman or Kenny G. He's just John Stockton, the dude who was excellent for almost 20 years. During the 88-89 season, Jazz coach Frank Layton resigned and was replaced by former Bulls star Jerry Sloan. A throwback to the cigarette at halftime era of the NBA, Sloan was a 6'5 shooting guard who came to rumble. I mean, he averaged 7 rebounds per game 7 times and 6.9 two other times. He retired as a player over 40 years ago and still ranks in Chicago's top 5 for points, games, rebounds, and minutes. Only two guys played more minutes as Bulls, Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen. And like Stockton and Malone, Sloan stayed in Utah damn near forever. For 23 seasons, he led the most consistently gritty team in the NBA. With Sloan, Stockton, and Malone, the Jazz made the playoffs 15 years in a row. In Sloan's first 11 years coaching Utah, they finished outside the top 10 in defensive efficiency just once and were top 10 in point differential and three-point field goal percentage and led the NBA in winning percentage. Jazz's window started with 55 wins in the 89-90 season as the Showtime Lakers were aging out and ran through the 1990s. Two Hall of Famers in their primes means you're open for business. Only once did they win fewer than 50 games in a non-lockout season. And during the Bulls run from 1990 to 98, only Chicago had more wins than Utah. Five times the Jazz went to the Western Conference Finals. In 97 and 98, they made the NBA Finals where they met, well, you know, the whole point of this thing. From 89-90 through 97-98, including the playoffs, the Jazz had a 676 winning percentage against every NBA team but the Bulls. And in an era with Akeem Olajuwon's Rockets, Clyde Drexler's Blazers, Charles Barkley's Suns, David Robinson's Spurs, and Gary Payton's Sonics, the team with a real chance every year of that decade to win the West was the Utah Jazz. There wasn't really anything especially lovable about this bunch, though they'd definitely get the blue collar treatment if they played in a Rust Belt City but they did always have one or two, oh wait, he played for them guys. Dr. Dunkenstein, Daryl Griffith, you knew he played for the Jazz, but did you know he still played there in 91? There was also seven foot four Mark Eaton who played until 93. Jeff Malone shot jumpers from funny angles for three plus seasons. Tom Chambers, he even did a year in Utah, but was no longer able to dunk like the Suns gorilla jumping off a trampoline. A trampoline named Mark Jackson. Then there was the big dog, Antoine Carr. He played four seasons with the Jazz, including both trips to the finals. Carl was something everybody loves. A burly energy guy off the bench who didn't play especially dirty, but had a cool nickname and played with something like goggles on his face. If you don't love that, you don't love the NBA. There was also Greg Ostertag, who wasn't especially lovable, but the league dunked on him like they hated him, so I'm just trying to balance it out a little. So all that stuff I said earlier about the Jazz being gritty, yeah, the Jazz played dirty. Maybe they weren't dirty, but they played dirty. Remember that time the mailman split Isaiah Thomas' head open because Zeke was giving Stockton that work? 
Have you already forgotten all those dirty screens from Stockton and Hornacek that fueled Sloan's offense? The Jazz didn't have the Knicks' reputation, but they achieved very similar results via very similar means. People just cut them some slack they didn't think they were capable of better. Hornacek stands out, though. Being shadier than advertised while also being a little overrated will do that. Seriously, the Jazz retired his jersey. Or maybe they did that to try to erase the memory of one of those times when Jerry Stackhouse had had enough. Jeff Hornacek was telling me about how bad we were and all this during the game. I didn't think that this guy talked like that. He looked like a little choir boy. But he was giving it to me, and I just, the frustration just overflowed. Carl Malone? A Google search will tell you what there is to hate about Carl Malone. And I ain't just talking about basketball. Here's the best moment of the 90s for the Jazz, and it ain't even close. After all those years of winning but not actually winning anything, after watching almost all their rivals in the West make the NBA Finals before they had, here's John Stockton in Game 6 of the 1997 Western Conference Finals. Stock for three! Stock! Got it! Unbelievable! John Stockton! John Stockton! It's over! The Jazz win it! The stars that I highlight, by the way, are the jerseys. Kids, in the 90s, hockey jerseys were in all the rap videos, so the NBA tried to catch that wave. That's how you wind up with the Rockets with that B-minus science project on their chest and the Jazz with snow-capped mountains on their jersey, bringing the ideas of Jazz, Utah, and Coors Light together in one uniform. That's what the 90s were like. We can go back to 1987, when Jordan dunked with John Stockton in his area, prompting a Utah fan to tell Jordan to pick on someone his own size. Which, duh, meant Mike would do so, forcing Mel Turpin to get dunked on because somebody had to get dunked on. And remember when I said Utah had a 676 winning percentage against the rest of the league in this stretch? That fell to 400 against the Bulls. But let's get to those two years in the NBA Finals. Between the 97 and 98 Finals, Jordan had more points in clutch time than Malone and Stockton combined. But this really comes down to two games. First is the flu game, which is what we call it because the food poisoning game doesn't have the same ring to it, but whatever. Never had Jordan looked so physically weak, obviously ill with his team tied 2-2 in Utah trying to take game five. And the man willed himself to 38 points, including seven points in a 10-0 Bulls run in the fourth quarter that gave Chicago the lead. The Bulls went back to Chicago and closed out the Jazz in six. Then there's game six in 98. Okay, it's really the last minute of game six in 98. Jordan scored 45 for the game, and that's really impressive. But don't forget that Scottie Pippen was on his last leg, struggling with a back injury in that game. The likelihood of a Bulls championship would have plummeted had this gone to game seven. Down three with 41 seconds left, Jordan took it right at Brian Russell for a bucket, as he had all night long. Then Mike came to the other end of the floor, stripped Malone in the post, went back, isolated against Russell, and, well, you know how that went. Jordan, open, Chicago with the lead! Series done, window done, everything done. You can say the Jazz were complicit in what happened in those series against the Bulls, especially Malone, who got one of those we're tired of giving the same guy the MVP so here you go trophies in 97 and then came up short. But where they've got to kick themselves is what happened when Jordan was playing baseball. Before the Bulls, Utah's nemesis was the Rockets. In 1994, on the way to a title, the Rockets were favored in the Western Conference Finals against Utah and won in five games. But in 95, the Rockets won 47 regular season games. The Jazz won 60, had the second best record in the West, and were up 2-1 in a best of five first round series against Houston. Then, at home and up seven going into the fourth quarter of game five, Utah blew it and the Rockets began their improbable second championship run. But hey, Jazz got him in 97. And that was that. Solid year after solid year, chance after chance. Two Hall of Famers in uniform and one in a suit and zero titles. That was the score for so many teams in Jordan's 90s. But nobody should feel bad for Carl Malone. Not on my watch. Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.